Hi, everybody. Welcome to our event today. Um, really glad you could join us. My name is Graham Cornwell. I'm the assistant dean for research at the Elliott School of International Affairs. And um, we are really kind of lucky to, to be bringing um, four of our faculty members here who are all um, audio is good. Yeah. Okay. Who are all journal editors, uh, scholarly journal editors. And um, for just kind of a free flowing conversation about what it's like to be a journal editor, um, you know, what, what kinds of, uh, what kinds of things are they looking for in a piece? Um, how is the, their, their journal changing or, you know, how even has being a journal editor informed their own work. So, um, the floor will be open later and we have some questions that have been pre submitted. If you have questions, please send them directly to me via uh, in the chat, Graham Cornwell in the chat. Um, and I will, um, uh, hopefully. I'm just going to briefly introduce our panelists and then um, kick it to them for some a very short introduction of their journal and their work, and um, and then we'll the floor will be open to to Q and A. Um, okay, first we have uh, Marlene Laudwell. Uh, Marlene is a research professor of international affairs and the editor in chief of Central Asian Affairs, as well as the director of our Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies here at the Elliott School. Next, we have Dr. Alexander Lennon. Um, Alex is pr professorial lecturer in international affairs. He has served as the editor in chief of the Washington Quarterly for over 20 years. Then we have Dr. Jisoo Kim. Jisoo is the Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Languages and Literatures, as well as the editor in chief of the Journal of Korean Studies and the director of our GW Institute for Korean Studies. And last but not least, we have Dr. Harris Milonis. Harris is the is associate professor of political science and international affairs, and the editor in chief of the Nationalities Papers, published by Cambridge. Um, I think we'll just go in order that I that I read the name. So, Marlene, um, I'll I'll send it to you first. To okay. Thank you, Graham. I, I would just remind everybody to sorry to please mute when you're you're not speaking. Thanks, Rahan. So, yeah, I'm the editor, the chief editor of Central Asian Affairs, which is a journal that we created like uh, six years ago at GW. That is now a peer reviewed journal that is in the process of getting in all the database because usually you need five years of a journal before accessing the main kind of Scopus style database. And so we are covering the post Soviet Central Asian region and the countries around, so like China, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, and Central Asia itself. And the main challenge that I have as a chief editor is that everything is done on a voluntary basis, right? So finding reviewers is our key issues and probably the, the, the issue, the most difficult we have to face it is to find people who have time to review. One advice, because we have been asked to be very short, so to have more time for discussion, one advice to give to junior scholars who want to publish is that you really need to look at the journal you want to publish before beginning writing. You need to look at the previous issues, to read previous articles published by that journal, to get inspiration on the way the articles that have been published are framed to, to give you more chance to be published. So that's, I think, a key uh, issue that very often junior scholars write an article without having in mind any specific journal. And that's how things get difficult. You really need to look at the journal first. Now we'll just stop here. I was very brief. Thank you, Marlene. Um, OK, Alex, we'll send it to you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Alex Lennon. I am the editor of the Washington Quarterly. And as Graham said, I've been doing that for about uh, 22 years. Um, the Washington Quarterly actually started as the journal of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, um, which is when I started in 1998. And we moved actually to GW at the beginning of 2014 uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm gonna save the sort of uh, anecdote about how I got to be the editor for the discussion, because I think that's gonna come up in there. The journal, as some of you may know, is um, broadly on security affairs writ large. We look for diverse perspectives on issues of strategic significance to global security. Um, and the tradition of the journal, it has a lot of uh, its background prior to me coming on actually 20 years ago, even in nuclear issues in particular, uh, arms control and nonproliferation. 
We do a lot of work on China and Asian security, increasingly with India as well. A lot of work on the change of coercion, um, not just on military force, but increasingly on sanctions and sanction strategy. And uh, the course that I teach in the spring is on U.S. grand strategy, which fits very much in with the journal. It's basically looking at the variety of ways, approaches, uh, both tools and challenges for global security and grand strategy. Um, and with that, I'll leave the sort of uh, other details for those questions and answer the discussion. Look forward to it. Alex, thank you. Um, okay, Jizu, you're next, please. All right. Um, so I'm the editor in chief of the Journal of Korean Studies. I uh, it's not been long since I succeeded this role. I succeeded this role um, during the summer of 2019, but it officially um, so the office of the Journal of Korean Studies officially moved to GW from Columbia University uh, starting from February, early February. Uh, or, this year in February, so 2020. So, but the history of Journal of Korean Studies goes uh, way further back. So it was first established in 1969. So it's been 51 years now, and uh, it is dedicated to publishing quality articles in all disciplines uh, in the field of Korean studies. Uh, so it covers a broad range of top topics concerning Korea, both historical and contemporary, and uh, the journal encourages transnational interdisciplinary approaches to scholarship. And one of the leading journals in the field of Korean studies, the journal continues to play a critical role in encouraging high quality um, scholarly discussions and shaping the field. So it is, um, it covers really a broad uh, disciplines. And um, so as, a, as you know, uh, the Journal of Korean Studies, what it's mainly looking for is really uh, the uh, the manuscripts that that could appeal to wide readership. So that's really uh, very, very important. Um, and so we consider readership, scholarly contribution, and also quality of the manuscript. So these are the main things that we look for when we uh, read, uh, when we receive manuscripts. Well, uh, well, one challenge, as Marlene mentioned, really finding reviewers is always difficult. So that's always an issue. And um, so for advice when you're, when you're uh, submitting uh, articles, I mean, manuscripts to a journal, I think it's important to really um, look for what's the uh, scope and uh, aim of the journal. So it's to do your homework first, right, before submitting it. So what this journal is looking for. All right, and I'll, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions later. That's perfect, thank you. Um, and Harris, please take us away. I need to unmute first. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining and for tuning in. So I'm just pasting the link so that you can get a better um, you know, description of the journal. Um, but basically, we're a multidisciplinary journal, nationality papers. We were founded uh, in 1972, so we're quite old. Um, and um, as you can tell from the title, this was um, a title that was more or less um, inspired by the nationalities policies of the Soviet Union. So initially, it was primarily focused um, on Soviet Union policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis nationalities, right? Um, but it has grown uh, quite a bit since then. Marlene is actually on our uh, editorial board as well. Uh, and um, we are um, we are an international journal. We are owned by the Association for the Study of Nationalities. Uh, uh, and we're published by Cambridge University Press. Um, we continue to have uh, geographical emphasis in the post-Soviet space, but also more generally uh, Eurasia. But we do publish theoretical and empirical work on nationalism, ethnicity, and, and um, identity broadly uh, from other parts of in, involving other parts of the world. And we primarily publish work by political scientists, historians, and sociologists, and, and anthropologists. But we're open to uh, scholars from other fields. We're viewing uh, manuscripts from fine arts all the way to um, um, uh, literature. So. So in that sense, we're multidisciplinary. Um, should I also add the challenge? The challenge is to get people to, uh, primarily for us is I think, to get people uh, to cite the work they read and they build on, even though it's not in a top uh, a discipline journal. And especially with multidisciplinary journals, 
it's really hard um, you know, to develop those networks that usually are developed in uh, discipline, uh, more narrow discipline journals where you know, citations come from people uh, citing each other and so forth. So, so primarily for us, was, it's a challenge to, to get um, our impact factor to go up as a result of the type of work we like to promote and to publish. But we're not willing to dilute our product to achieve that goal. So, Great, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to start off because I have questions I want to ask too. Um, and uh, all of you kind of hit on this a little bit, but maybe each of you could talk a bit about what you see as your main audience. And, um, you know, I, I imagine it's sort of in the academy or at least scholarly, but, you know, maybe a, a smaller subset of that. Who, who are you? Um, who are you targeting? Uh, Anyone could jump in. Is it in the order or do you just can you? No, Jizu, you, you lit up first. So okay. I'm just asking for order, but anyway, okay, I'll start. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, this Journal of Korean Studies is interdisciplinary journal, and so our audience is really, really broad. Um, actually, when it first began, our main per audience was. Um, history and uh, literature because in the in the field of humanities because that's how um, the, you know there were more scholars uh, involved in, uh, engaged in that field and so obviously there were you know more scholars submitting in that, uh, from that field but there's uh, but over the years uh, scholars in the field of social sciences of course increased and uh, now we have kind of expanded to cover um, just you know really the a broad range of uh, disciplines um, so whatever so we don't really define so if the pay if the uh, article contributes in any way to Korean studies and the research involves Korea in any way, then uh, we tend to, um, you know, accept it and we tend to publish. So, for example, uh, recently we began to include, you know, uh, uh, from the field of education. So a, a paper that was that discusses about uh, you know South Korea's education, and I think it was the first time that uh, that it was the the, the, the article uh, in the field of education was published. So uh, we are really you know expanding the field and trying to really you know um, uh, build this journal uh, of Korean studies in, as a um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, 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 into an interdisciplinary field. Um, so our main audience is not, but it's not, we are not targeting to just Korean studies. Of course, you know, our main uh, re, uh, readers are in the field of Korean studies, but also East Asia and, the, and just in the field general, generally, scholarly field generally, whoever finds our, you know, article to be useful, we expect them to read it. So um, I think, again, with as the field also expanded, I think we expand our uh, readership, our audience to also um, broaden. You know, if I can jump in, same for us, we are really focusing on the region. We are interdisciplinary and everything that can help advancing Central Asian studies is, is uh, welcome. So it's really social science mostly, a little bit of humanities, and sometimes we also try to reach out to, poli to the policy community. So we have an um, article that try to be a little bit more, uh, still academically based, but a little bit more policy than some other uh, journals, like really following what is happening in the region and being kind of close to the, the events going on in the region. Alex, I mean, yeah. I, I would think I'm, I'm, the, the quarterly must have sort of an interesting mix of, of audiences. It does. I was going to say, so one of the things I should have mentioned at the beginning that makes the quarterly different is because it's a policy journal, it's also not peer reviewed. And that also means that our audience is quite different. Um, we sort of target four different groups, one of which is academics who work on policy issues and are trying to influence contemporary events. That's actually a quite a large growing field, particularly in the last four years or so. Um, and for those of you that know the organization Bridging the Gap, that's a lot of the same community that they reach out to for academics that are trying to influence policy. The second is the think tank community globally, uh, the people that are working on the fringes of and in many other countries in particular actually contributing in 
particularly through policy planning offices and in the formulation of regional and global strategies in addition to policies. Um, the third is the media that works on these issues, particularly for sort of longer background, deeper trends, 5,000 words rather than the stuff that you'd fit into a typical article. And the fourth is government communities, but specifically the intelligence communities, the diplomatic community, and staff members that will read about 5,000 words or so. Most policymakers will not read something that requires you to turn the page. And if they used to, it was when they were on an airplane, which doesn't happen as much anymore. So for the longer pieces, you really have to kind of target the environment around the policymaker if you want to do that. That's less of a priority for us than the media, the think tanks, and scholars who are working on uh, contemporary affairs. Yeah, um, and our, I would say our audience um, includes um, all of our members, the association members, obviously, and the, whenever you become a member of the Association for the Study of Nationality, so when you do, uh, you will receive, uh, you'll have access to our uh, journal. Uh, but obviously, that's not just that. Uh, we have uh, a huge network of uh, former attendees of our annual convention, which is actually um, uh, coming up and it's going to be online, like our talk today, uh, in, uh, in, in next year. Um, and, um, I'm going to post some information on that. So we have, um, that association linkage that kind of, um, gives an organic readership, but obviously then, uh, the whole academic, uh, establishment globally that is interested in our area and our topics, we hope is our readership. Yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to ask one more and then I want to turn it over to every, everybody else. And this actually comes from the, some of the pre-submitted questions. Um, do you receive pitches for articles before they come in? I mean, I think especially maybe the peer review process is such that people maybe are sending in full drafts of articles, you know, with an abstract, et cetera, um, for the first time. But do you have people writing to you and saying, I have an article, I have a piece I'm working on, it's about this. What do you think? Is it a good fit? Um, and if so, what's the best way to go about doing that? Or I can jump in. Yes, we are receiving them often abstract, sometimes already written paper, so they don't submit to the platform, they submit to us asking that fee. And sometimes even we are receiving master thesis entirely with students asking, okay, if I rewrite my master thesis, do you think that would be that would fit your journal. So uh, we got a lot of this kind of uh, spontaneous, let's say, uh, engagement, and it's even not submission, like pre-submission. And I mean, someone else can jump in too. Is that is that helpful? I mean, do you do you find that you can kind of tell how a piece how a piece might fit or might work from a pitch like that, or do you like to see the full the full draft? <laughs> Well, I can, I can continue for us usually. Um, at least you can tell people when the article will not fit. When you see, you can see it will not fit. At least you can stop people before they spend time writing. But some, of course, you don't know. So you have to say, yeah, potentially it will fit, but you have to make the official submission and it has to be reviewed. I cannot guarantee anything. So it helps kind of stopping some submissions that are not in the right like direction for the journal. Um, a lot of a lot of this is usually answered by the little blurbs that um, we have on our websites, right? So the first step that authors should take is read carefully what how we define the aims and scope of the journal, and decide whether you know it fits. If they cannot make up their minds, they can ask first their you know um, advisors or professors if they're grad students or. Uh, colleagues, if they're junior scholars, what would be a good fit? Uh, and obviously, they can also email the managing editor or the editor in chief, right? So uh, I do get a lot of such emails. I'm sure my managing editor is getting more. Uh, I would hope. Um, but usually, I, uh, as a matter of principle, in my case, I won't speak for anyone else. I don't um, discourage anyone uh, to submit, especially when they're within the scopes. Uh, of the scope of the journal. Now, that doesn't mean they cannot get desk rejected, and we can talk about this uh, later. Uh, it could still lead to a desk rejection if the we think the article is not actually there yet. 
uh, not even being reviewed. I mean, that doesn't mean that the editor in chief or the managing editor lied to the person or didn't say the right thing. Um, when you get a one liner, the main thing you can actually uh, adjudicate is um, whether it fits the topics that are covered and the, you know, the approach that is covered in your journal. I wouldn't advise, of course, to do more than that, because then it's actually almost asking for a peer review without going through peer review. So your, to your question, Graham, uh, whether you could send something more, or you want to see something more. Maybe that's the case uh, in the case of Alex's journal. Maybe he wants to see more. But in our case, uh, that would violate, in my, in my case at least, it would violate how I understand peer review. So that's why I would stop at the topic, does it fit kind of question. Yeah, just to build on um, what Harris just said, I think it's also um, you know, very important to understand and know the journal, right? Uh, the, what the scope and aim is. And um, so, for example, like in our case, in, uh, for the Journal of Korean Studies, so in the fields like, let's say, sociology, right? Uh, there are papers that focus on Korea, but uh, the sociology journals tend to don't tend not to like papers that just solely focus on one country. And so in that case, it fits more, uh, authors think that it fits more into um, our journal. And, um, and I think for our journal, I mean, it's totally fine. But what we uh, suggest is to be able to appeal to interdisciplinary audiences, not just for sociology uh, readers, but also, but more, uh, you know, that's appealing to broad readership. So that's what we folk, we emphasize. And um, again, you know, like as Harry Harris mentioned, we do. I mean, I do receive emails, um, you know, asking whether it fits or it looks good or you know, it's um, there. Uh, they can submit it uh, to the journal. One of the questions they also ask is the pipeline, right? Like if they submitted, how long would it take? So I think this is especially important for, for junior scholars um, who are in the tenure track um, or, you know, also for who are in the job market, right? Um, because it's important for them to publish uh, as soon as possible. So I, for, I try to be um, not that, you know, I give preference or anything, but I try to be supportive to junior scholars when it comes to publishing because it is really important for their career. Uh, but we also uh, do desk rejection. And uh, oftentimes we, when we do desk rejection, I mean, it depends on the quality of the paper. If it doesn't really fit and if it doesn't really appeal to, you know, Korean studies, then uh, we just, you know, uh, desk reject. But uh, we tend to give, if we think that it has potential to improve, right? So before sending out to, uh, sending out for peer review, we get back to the author and say that we think the topic is very interesting and it has potential. Could you revise, um, you know, and could you revise uh, and uh, improve uh, your paper and then resubmit it. But again, that resubmission does not guarantee uh, being uh, sent being sending out to peer review and getting it published. So, of course, we make it uh, clear uh, in the email when we write back to them. And for us, um, there's really four channels through which we get pieces. Uh, the first one is we do get full manuscripts. Particularly from academics, that tends to be an avalanche after ISA and APSA of the full manuscripts once they've gone through um, the conference and feedback from there, and hopefully they've been revised, taking that into account. Uh, the second is the pitches, and especially in our field in, in security policy, for those of you who are on Twitter, um, you may know that Morgan Kaplan at International Security frequently does his kind of pitch fit Fridays as a day where he tries to channel it that way. Um, for us, it's something similar. I find it's often the most effective way that we can find out and let the author know quickly whether we're a good audience for it. And also before they draft something in full, if there is a way that they can shape the draft to make it more likely to be uh, accepted. So if it has to take certain factors into consideration, if they have to make sure it's not just an audience that appeals to a single country because we're really a global journal, uh, something like that that can help them shape the draft so that we don't get a full draft and then go back and give them that after effect. The one a bit, a bit of advice I would give for those who are doing uh, pitches, and I think it sort of echoes what Harris said before, make it a sentence, not a paragraph or a page. 
don't use the pitch to demonstrate your full depth of knowledge on a subject because the hardest part is going to be to construct that thesis sentence around which you will write for us a 5,000 word or so article. If you can't get that one sentence right yet, you're not ready to pitch yet. And that may be the biggest part of the discipline is actually putting yourself through the exercise of can I get this concise? Can I get it in a way that an editor is going to read it quickly and be able to make a quick determination and not feel like I've got to demonstrate that I know the globe's history on this subject uh, in you know a long email? That's going to make it much more likely to have a, uh, an effect or be uh, directed um, uh, most well. The advice I actually got from um, John Steinbrenner, who is my dissertation chair, having written 300 you know pages, is when you have the one sentence version to start your defense right, you're ready to defend. So if you can do it with a 300 page piece, you've got to be able to do it with a concept for what you're going to write an article of about 5,000 words or so for. Uh, the other ways that we take pieces are, the third is we recruit based on pitches. What I mean by that is I've had a lot of articles where I've seen Twitter discussions from people, particularly since the pandemic has started, or prior to that from DC area, um, uh, conversations, Council on Foreign Relations meetings, Brookings meetings, Carnegie meetings, places where people are really trotting out their ideas before they feel they're ready to put them yet in the permanence of putting a full article down. And if it's something that I think is interesting and isn't out there, we'll reach out to them based on that. And sort of that is the trial run for what they're willing to put into a larger piece. The very rare case is the fourth channel, which is we do a full solicitation of something that nobody's written before. One example of that that might give you a sense of how rare that is, is we solicited Joe Nye for a piece on interdependence with China and the risks of decoupling because of the book that he had written in the 1970s, Power and Interdependence. So it's very rare that we go out to somebody and ask for a full article, but it does happen occasionally in our cases. Keep the pitches short, though, if you're going to pitch and send them by email um, is, the, is, to me, uh, and for a journal like a policy journal like us, the best way to do it. Great, that's that's super helpful. All right, we're gonna to turn to audience questions now. Um, and the first is just simply, do you publish graduate students, PhD students, and if so, how often? We don't we don't discriminate based on any any characteristic, to be honest. I mean, we actually actively are trying to recruit also marginalized uh, articles from marginalized communities or underrepresented communities. We have included that in our instructions to the author. So uh, anything that is within our aims and scope uh, description um, that fits the way we describe uh, what we publish, which goes back to the distinctions between what Alex is publishing and what we're publishing. So for example, we have our, our upper word limit is 12,000 words. That's very different from what Alex can publish, right? Uh, so <clears throat> within those bounds, um, if I receive a 2,000 word article that claims to be a research article, it's not because it's coming from someone who is a professor or not that I would publish it, right? Um, so it has to fit what we consider a research article and, uh, and check some of those boxes, but it doesn't really matter who is submitting from, from my perspective at least. I, uh, yeah, I think I, I, I agree. It's the same for our journal. We don't discriminate or we don't, you know, I mean, we don't take into consideration um, uh, um, of uh, we, so we, it's, it's, it's purely based on the quality um, of the article and how it contributes to the field. Uh, so if let's say a grad student, it could be MA or PhD student who writes an excellent paper, of course, we sub, uh, we publish it. So we don't. That's really not a uh, component that we take into consideration. Yes, same for us. And in fact, the, the review process is blind, right? So people are reviewing the article have no clue who are they are who they are reviewing. It can be a, grad, a great grad student or a very famous professor. They have no clue. I mean, they can guess because based on the context, if they see the article having a very kind of schoolish style they can guess he's still a student but otherwise no one knows who is submitting except the chief editor who can access the page with the name the email and sometimes you can guess okay it's a student but otherwise the the reviewer had no clue so they, there is no discrimination it's really the company that will make the difference if I, if I can add something um on that it's the way we have a lot of power and that's why I emphasize, you know, un underrepresented groups in academia, whatever, 
you know, meaning like whatever other category you want to mean, uh, you want to put there, because it's not just um, junior scholars, because that was your question. It could be people of color. It could be, I'm saying it's not just one way you could have people who are thinking they may be somehow not given uh, the full um, extent of our attention, for example. It could be people who are, whose English is not good. We get a lot of such admissions. Uh, we have institutionalized ways. So, for example, we sent them a link. When I see a manuscript that it has poor English, but otherwise it's worthwhile in terms of theoretical uh, and other type of um, importance, um, I will suggest to them, and I have done that, to go and get some editing services first. Uh, and there are discounts. There are some, uh, some places where they do it even uh, pro bono. Because then um, the review process won't uh, bring it back as a rejection because ju just because of the English, for example. Or the other dimension that I want to mention that may be relevant for people is if somebody is using a methodology that is not mainstream, right? Again, it's my job as a, if I am to do my job correctly, I shouldn't send this article for review to someone who I know uh, will be negatively predisposed to that, I need to send it to the best possible person who is using that type of method. Uh, now, again, sometimes that's impossible, meaning it, it, it may be impossible literally to find someone who is using a particular type of methodology that is an expert also on the particular topic, and that combination may not exist. So you're trying to find someone who's an expert on the area and an expert on the methodology. So you are, those are, now going back to challenges, those are some of the biggest challenges in my view. Yeah, and for us, I think similar to the others, um, it really doesn't matter to us what your title is in, in, in the abstract. What I say is two things. One is for a policy journal like us, in a lot of cases, what we're looking for is in part people who have some professional experience working in policy as well. So if you're a graduate student who has worked in government at some level, you may have a better sense about what is going to be policy relevant is something to more that's more theoretically relevant to somebody who's been an academic for life. That's not always true because there's a lot of overlap and some people are more attuned to and try to and experienced in playing in the policy field or on the margins as well. But it doesn't matter what your title is. It matters what your training is in that way. And so along those lines, what I would say is just the process of writing a dissertation makes it much more likely that you are going to approach an issue with novelty. Right, a lot of master's assignments are a defined question on a set of research materials that is presented in a class, or it's a research paper that responds to a prompt that the professor gives the student. The PhD process is a bit different because you have to actually design the question that you're answering in the first place. And that's a bit more going to train you to be more likely to approach something uh, in the abstract. Now, if you have other experiences that train you to do that, then you have other experiences and that's fine. I think it's much less likely one of the things I would encourage people to do, at least for a journal like us or a security policy journal, most universities have embedded within them student run journals that are good training grounds to go through the process of policy journals. So at GW, for example, there is the International Affairs Review, which is a student run journal. Georgetown has a security studies journal that's also run by a graduate student that would put someone through the same process that, that would go through. It's just the competitive field is a bit different because it might be other graduate students or mostly graduate students from that school rather than the universe of people that are trying to write on a subject, which at least in the case of, of the uh, journal like the Washington Quarterly, we publish 40 articles a year and are trying to recruit not just American trained or, uh, authors, but we have a lot of authors that come from China, from France, from Germany, from the UK, from Iran, from all over the place. So the competitive field that you're working against is a bit different and getting that experience of going through the process is a good training ground, even if it's not going to be something off the bat that gets you into uh, you know, a journal like one of the four run here with your first shot. Great. Um, uh, okay, on to another question. Um, how did you become a journal editor? Was it a goal you always had or an opportunity that came along by chance? Were you begged by the, the I may say, editors? My uh, experience is so anomalous that it might be good to go first. Um, I had gone back to CSIS in the late 90s after starting uh, a stint briefly at the State Department. 
The founder of the organization who had been in place since CSIS started in 1962 was retiring. And I was the deputy director of studies and there was an internal review of the organization from top to bottom. In those internal discussions, I was the one that advocated the value of the Washington Quarterly as a educational tool that did something that no other part of CSIS as a think tank did, particularly because it had been so fundamental to my training as a graduate student at that time, just starting in a PhD program in the late 90s, um, that I had learned international affairs through reading journals like the Washington Quarterly and thought it was particularly useful. The organization basically said, we don't want to pay someone a ton of money to do this. We don't know anyone else that has any idea what to do with this journal. So if you want the job, you can become the editor of the Washington Quarterly instead of being the deputy director of studies. And that was 22 years ago, and I can't imagine a job I'd rather do. So I've been, uh, been doing it ever since. The thing I would also mention is that there used to be in the early noughts after the Iraq, um, the Iraq war in particular, a foundation sponsored by a German foundation um, network of inter transatlantic editors on international affairs journals. And in that network, what I found was that editors are actually in the policy journal space, some of which were peer reviewed, some of which were not. This odd mix of journalists with a completely different training and academics with more of a research background. And it was about a 50-50 split that ranged from everything from the publisher of foreign affairs had a journalist background and his managing editor was an academic, to the one who ran Chatham House's journal International Affairs was a journalist as well. So it is a totally different and very haphazard process that doesn't actually have any sort of pathway that I found that leads one to become a journal uh, in the first place. But as a job, I love it for reasons I'm happy to talk about later. Like in my case, I think, you know, it was, um, I think it's opposite to Alex. It's it's just very you know normal. <laughs> the previous um, editor reached out to me uh, that he wanted to step down from the uh, editorship role, and he reached out to me and asking whether I'd be interested. So I gave um, some thoughts <laughs> for a while. <laughs> this is you know really taking additional. Um, role a huge service to the field it is which is i mean the journal is a very important uh journal so uh, it was a huge responsibility that came along with it and so i um had to think it through and then i decided to um just uh take it and uh and that's how i just became the editor <laughs> of the journal so not so fun <laughs> Marlon Harris, I guess Marlon created it. So, yeah, in my case, I was a member of several other editorial boards for the journal, and then when I launched the Central Asia program at GW, I realized how much we were missing a kind of peer review academic journal on the region, and so I launched it. So, but as it was just said, it's a huge service to the field, but it's I mean. I'm not enjoying the job particularly, I must say. I think it's a burden more than anything, but I'm doing it because it should be done, but it's it's a tough job. Yeah, so, so uh, everybody has a very different path. That's why it's fascinating. Um, we have, uh, we're all part, every editor has been a part of the Association for the Study of Nationalities that kind of, you know, go hand in hand. So I joined the Association for the Study of Nationalities as a member in the early 2000s. And then in the early 2000, you know, 2010s, let's say, uh, the then editor-in-chief Florian Bieber, who is now actually the president of the association, there's a, uh, a, a revolving door there in a way. Um, <clears throat> he had asked me to become an associate editor. And uh, then I had the much smaller, you know, um, um, portfolio. Marlene has served in that role too. And um, and there I was just responsible for similar pieces like the ones that Alex is still listing. So we were actually competing for the same type of work back then. He didn't know that because his journal was uh, more known in the policy world, obviously, than my small section. It was called Analysis of Current Events. And we would get like prominent figures that had um, experience or younger folks, actually, <clears throat> that had involvement to write on current events. So it was very different style than what we usually publish. So it was only one article per issue uh, when we published about 10 articles per issue. 
So, um, and then uh, when, uh, after another editor in chief uh, was in that position, Peter Rutland, then I was kind of tapped to take over. So it was more organic because of the, my, my involvement in the association, I was on the board of the association. So kind of, it's almost like half uh, an owner, half uh, uh, a curse kind of thing. You, you got to, you know, take one for the team kind of thing. Yeah. It's very, very generous of you. Um, this may be, may be a quick question at, as I returned to my, my uh, physical mailbox on campus at some point in August and had three journal copies waiting for me that were, you know, six months old. Um, it made me wonder, and we have a question uh, in the comments, is there a future for paper journals or is the trend towards online um, publications irreversible? <laughs> Honestly, I think it's quite irreversible. I hope books in paper will still survive, journals in paper, I'm not sure. But I think the main issue on that kind of financial aspect of the journal is the role that big publishing houses are playing in, in selling very expensive database. And so you have all this important discussion about the fact that uh, People submit articles for free, right? They don't get paid. Usually all the editorial board is working for free also, but then you have a big publisher who is selling the journal at a very expensive price. So there is a whole kind of inner commercial logic of publishing journal that is quite problematic. So for the Journal of Korean Studies, um, it used to... Um, uh, Publish on its own and, and also it had connections with uh, project muse and that's how they were publishing. But uh, as it moved to as the editorship moved to Columbia University, um, they partner with Duke University Press. And so now it's been published by Duke University Press. And um, so I guess, you know, uh, in, when it comes to publishing, I think it's the the um, publisher <laughs> that has its you know authority to decide how to go about it. So in you know, but but I think the trend is, the trend is I think ultimately it will it is likely to go online. But but I mean we do still publish. For example, like last year we, there was like more than seven hundred uh, uh, volumes that we uh, seven hundred copies that we published. So we do still continue to publish both uh, hard copies and uh, of course you know it gets to be distributed online as well. But I can imagine, obviously, in the going, you know, going uh, forward, it, it may be likely to move on to um, really digital copies. But I don't know I don't <coughs> how from the uh, publisher's point of view. We, we moved. We moved um, from Taylor and Francis to a, a academic press, Cambridge University Press, and that move to an extent was informed by some of these discussions that Marlene especially raised. In the sense of like what's the future of and what's the role of our role there we happen to own our own journal so we're not owned by some uh press or some uh corporation as some journals are actually so we have the you know capacity to move uh, our journal around as this is the journal as well i guess and marlens is also able i don't know about alex how what's the you know structure so some journals though are owned by the press or are owned by let's say um sage or a uh, taylor francis or what have you right so so that's a very different situation so that's one thing to for the audience to keep in mind the second one is um let's not conflate the access open access online or in print with uh print or online right those are two separate related but separate questions um Cambridge University Press and other academic presses, I'm sure Duke as well is considering, a lot of them are moving towards making access more easy, but not necessarily giving up, you know, copyright issues and so on and so forth. So, so there are um, in between categories, you get a link where you can share your work with anyone, the full extent of your work that would used, used to be impossible to get that, uh, legally share it. But you're not allowed to share the PDF of the actual article. So there are all these liminal categories that are being created. All of this looks like we're moving towards more uh, open access for the reasons that Marlene indicated. 
Um, and that's spearheaded by academic presses, not obviously by those other um, companies, because again, there are financial implications that uh, are go with it. The online versus print, I think it's also to, it's actually independent because it's uh, to an extent driven by the co customer as well, right? The audience. So uh, I have been choosing online from a lot of the journals I'm subscribing just because it's easier for me and I don't have the space problems and so on and so forth. So, so a lot of it will be driven by demand, right? It's not it's not a, the politics of you know um, um, copyright infringement and uh, or. Um, uh, all these packages that Merlin is talking about that are sold um, uh, in libraries that are pr both for online and print, right? So, so those are related, but not the same exact uh, type of uh, conversation. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, to a large extent, I think this can get over overrated about how, what the difference between the two is. It, I think if you look at three factors, they're all driving it toward um, online more with with one exception. In general, the cost is less because there's no printing costs involved as opposed to digital production. In general, if you are looking at back issues, it's much faster to look online than try and wander through stacks that cost universities huge amounts of real estate to keep all this stuff. They're burning all the old volumes that they used to. So it doesn't make any sense to keep all that back issues when you can do it electronically through some of these aggregators like Project Muse or others. And third is if you want the new issue, it's much faster to get it digitally rather than wait to get your hands on the hard copy or figure out how to do so. So whether it's the speed and the ease of immediate access or the background of doing a deep dive on a research topic for the back issues, it seems like we're moving in that direction. The exception is people that either like to put their hands on the copy when they read through it, and particularly if you have a, 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 a narrower base that really reads one journal religiously and other things loosely. That one journal may be something that academics want to keep on their bookshelf, that somebody wants a hard copy of something that they uh, printed or published in, that an editorial board member may want a copy on their bookshelf of. But unless you want that kind of trophy effect of a printed copy, it's moving digitally. And I think uh, Harris and Marlene both hit it on the head. The question now increasingly is becoming open access versus not, rather than digital versus print. That's the way the industry has moved in the last couple of years. Um, I want to ask a question about non-native English speakers and, you know, Harris, you touched on this a little bit, but what do you do when you get a, um, a publication uh, or a submission rather that is, has some quality ideas, you know, definitely sort of uh, in the mix to be published, but, um, you know, is kind of lacking the, the grasp of English to, to maybe fit and be at the level of your journal. So I can tell for us because the majority of the submission we received are, or let's say half of the submission at least that we receive are not by English native speaker. So if the article is accepted, the English is really an issue, then it's more or less on me to decide if either I send back to the author asking him or her to find an editor, knowing that for people from the region I work on, it's often very expensive to find a, a, a good uh, English editor, or sometimes if really I consider the topic is really incredible, I really don't want to meet the opportunity, then I have the, the Central Asia program editors and I kind of decide, so it's uh, let's say at my discretion to decide if I want to participate in editing the article on our own budget or if I send it back to the to the, the author. But we can do that because we are a small structure, we don't have so many. Uh, uh, articles and, and the programs and the journal are kind of interacting. So for any for the journal, I think it would be much difficult to decide to edit, you know, article on their own money. Um, we receive uh, many papers from Korea, so from um, non-native speakers, and uh, English obviously um, is an issue. For these scholars, uh, so what we so in order to encourage scholars from Korea to submit, um, so that you know we encourage more interactive dialogue uh, in the field, we have asked. Um, so we have asked them to they can write their paper in Korean first, 
And then, because sometimes, you know, to publish to um, the journal, they try to write in English, and which really makes it more awkward. And so they, we, um, we've encouraged them to write in Korean first um, and have a full paper and then um, have it translated to English um, and then uh, submit. But, but we have... Uh, but it is difficult for the journal to be responsible. So we do uh, ask ask authors to be responsible for the translation um, if they want to submit it in English. So, um, I mean, there is that limitation, but uh, that's how we encourage uh, right now, especially for scholars uh, uh, trying to submit in English uh, from Korea. Alex or Harris, you could add. Yeah, I mean, I, at least for us, I think for because we're a global security journal, because we work in international affairs, I view that as our job. It's not about the quality of the English language writing. It's about the quality of the ideas behind the writing. And so there's two different times when you're looking through it. One is when you're considering submissions and deciding whether to publish it or not. And that much more for me is about the way the article is framed and the methodology they use to support the arguments. It's not about the detailed writing and the grammar and the sentence structure and the language. And then of the 10 articles per quarter that we publish, that's where my associate editor is fantastic, Catherine Kaufman, who's a GW student, that's where she makes her living. That it's her job to make the quality of the ideas conveyed as clearly as possible. And it's, it's better when the author can do that and they have to approve all of the language that is used, but it's part of our job to make that as effectively as possible, especially for people who are not first language English speakers. That's what we do to get a variety and a diversity of ideas of non-English speakers in global security affairs. <clears throat> yeah, um, I, I already kind of spoke to this matter, but uh, just to add that um, primarily, uh, there are two ways to address this. I've um, talked with my managing editor and we try at the at the submission stage to if if these if we think that the language will be a problem to the extent that um, the reviewer is going to uh, not decide not to review based on that, then we send it back to the author and give the you know the advice that I told you earlier. Um, if and unfortunately we don't have our own resources to do that internally. If if it's good enough to be reviewed, we don't think, but it's not good enough to get published, that's a different category of manuscripts. Then uh, we do take care of it at the stage after it's being accepted. We do have obviously our own, in, in, you know, copy editors and Cambridge University Press has that capacity to improve the English at that stage. And we do a lot of that. I mean, we do that for native speakers, not just only non-native speakers. Um, but but uh, the most difficult situation is when you get something and you may just reject it because just for the language, uh, because it may make your life easier. I, I, I understand if some editors in chief do that, but I can, as a non-native speaker myself, I, I don't do that uh, on the basis of language. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's not just language. So it's not, it, language is yet another you know, problem. So... So we do desk reject um, uh, manuscripts quite a bit, but it's not because of language in my, in, to, at least in my view. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add, yeah, I agree with Harris. I mean, it's, uh, you know, when we, so when it gets to the, uh, so if the manuscript is accepted and uh, peer reviewed, after it being peer reviewed, if we decide to publish, then I mean at that point, as you know, Harris pointed out, I, either be native speaker or non-native speaker, all papers go through that copy editing process, and uh, Duke University Press, you know, uh, handles that professionally. So uh, we rely on them uh, with a with with copy editing process, but before so. But when we are talking about at the, you know, um, uh, uh, when it's been when it's been decided at the uh, desk uh, level, then I think what's yes, I mean, at one point, I think on the one hand, language it has to be written um, to the point that you know our reviewers will read it and review it. Um, 
Because if not, then again, if they don't review it, then there's no whole point. So it has to be to the point that it, you know, it will be able to be reviewed. And uh, but I think at the best, uh, uh, as as an from the editor's point of view, I definitely me myself, you know, being non-native speaker, I uh, do look at the quality more so than the um, than the language. I mean, even if the language is perfect, right? Even if English writing is so beautifully written, if it doesn't have substance, like the good contents, good quality, um, and scholarly contribution, I mean. Of course, it won't be able to be published. So um, there has to be that balance, but still at the same time, at the uh, beginning stage, I think um, ideas are more important. Um, but again, you know, I think uh, to a certain extent, there has to be some sort of balance because journals don't have that resources to go through all the, you know, um, uh, translation or copy editing process before being sending out before being sent out for peer reviews just to add graham um <clears throat> uh, in the previous um this round um we kind of discussed directly the main products of our journals but you know uh, a lot of our journals also publish book reviews and uh synthetic review articles uh, uh, non not just research articles so I understand there are a few graduate students uh, on the call, and maybe we'll listen to this later. Um, that may be a good first introduction uh, with a journal uh, between you and a journal editor or a, a journal team. Um, write a sorter, you know, book review, or so volunteer, or send an email with like a short bio of what you do to the managing editor, so they have them, they have you in mind as a as a reviewer or as a or, or, or as a. Um, a potential a book reviewer. We solicit that bo a book review, so there needs to be that interaction to an extent. Um, but other journals uh, accept unsolicited book reviews. So that's a, a, a good first step to learn how the process works from you know submission to publication, because there are a lot of hoops in between, right? And a lot of stages uh, that we are referring to here with like, you know, assuming everybody knows when is the proofing stage and when is the production stage and what, but a lot of this is new to people. So one way to find out is with like a lower stakes um, manuscript. Also to add, uh, so for yeah, the first Korean studies, we, um, we, so one issue, so we publish two issues every year and one issue is for general articles and the other is for special issue. So if there's a call for papers for special issue, I would highly encourage, uh, you know, uh, junior grad students or junior scholars to submit and see if they can be, uh, the, if they can, you know, participate in that special issue because it is, although, I mean, it all gets peer reviewed, it's the same, we go through the same process, but still at the same time, if it's uh, included in the special issue, it is more likely as, you know, um, as a whole to be published, although it's not guaranteed if let's say one or two articles get bad reviews and uh, it's not fit uh, uh, in the special issue, I mean, it could be, um, you know, rejected, but it is uh, more, likely because there is that you know broader theme and um and you know as long as you are able to write uh you know a quality paper then it is likely to be published and i think it's you know it's also one good way to um uh in addition to writing book reviews if you if, if you see any special if, if, special issue call for papers i would encourage um students to submit. I just posted one just so they know how it looks like. We, we're running one on nationalism and racial hierarchies. Um. So um, I, I want to follow up on the, on the, these two points re really interesting with, with Alex and Marlene um, but, and also ask, so you have, you know, we think of journal journals as having these sort of research length journal articles and then, you know, perhaps some book reviews at the end. But as you point out, there, there are other couple ways, review essays, sometimes there are round tables. Um, or even like sort of a current, some journals might have a current events kind of um, op-ed style, one or two pieces at the beginning. Um, do you do these in, in your journals? And if you don't or haven't, would you be open to that kind of submission of someone and saying, I have five people from this, you know, a conference panel. We want to each write a three page little, you know, sort of mini essay on this topic and kind of have a round table, but in written form. So 
for us, we have only a classic research article and book discussion, which is not exactly book review, it's book discussion. So it's three reviewers writing a review and reply to the three reviewers. I receive things that don't fit for the research article, the classic one. Usually I don't take them. I mean, not usually. I don't take them for the journal because the Central Asia program has all their mean of publication. We have our online uh, uh, paper series, so that's where we usually publish more kind of op-ed uh, style. So because we have this kind of large variety of publication, I really, the journal is only for classic academic article and everything else is directed to the online publication of the website of the program. Alex, how about the Washington Quarterly? Yeah, we made a conscious decision back when blogs were starting emer to emerge, uh, podcasts were starting to come out. Part of it is a staff limitation is we only have one and three quarters people that run the entire journal and uh, doing what we do takes the, takes the extent of our time as it is. That said, you're on the right idea, which is there are certain pathways you wanna try and create to allow yourself to think of writing as a muscle. You've got to keep writing in practice, whether it's in blog formats, whether it's in smaller uh, formats, just kind of build up to longer journal articles and eventually to books if you go on to sort of PhD length, length work or if you're doing PhD length work. The immediate instinct of some people is to try to think like, how do I write a book on that? You actually want to start smaller pieces and build out to the larger idea rather than with the big idea and try and build down. And it has become harder to find those op-ed formats. They're increasingly syndicated. They're increasingly paid for. So people have established their own blogs or looked for other outlets. In my field, War on the Rocks was really good about trying to establish something between the 750 word op-ed and either the 5,000 word Washington Quarterly or 10,000 word international security piece, more like that 2,500 kind of middle ground. And then they expanded for the journal length version to the Texas National Security Review as well. They do more sort of the formats where they have a large number of people in part because they have a much larger staff that can filter through and process and run the round table in that kind of uh, environment. So they're good things to look for. It's sometimes it's not all one stop shopping in a single journal and you've got to look in the area of your uh, area of expertise and interest and find out who's doing those types of formats to allow you to get the practice and kind of the gym work if you're thinking about writing as a muscle because it's particularly important. Um, I am reminded that we are out of time, uh, but this has been really good. Um, first, thank you to Diane Sang for organizing this for us. Um, and thank you to our four panelists very, very much. Our esteemed Elliott School faculty um, doing really interesting stuff and editing really cool journals. Um, and then thank you to all, uh, all of you all. If we were in person, I would thank you for coming out on a rainy day because it's pouring here in Washington. But, um, you know, it's just as nice virtually. Uh, this is a great conversation. Some quick takeaways. Anyone can publish. <clears throat> Journals don't discriminate. Um, you know, uh, so if you're whatever level you are, whatever kind of professional background, um, pitches are welcome, but be very, very concise. Uh, there are many different paths to becoming a journal editor. And, um, you know, we may be, we may be online and, and virtual uh, with our, with our publications. Uh, even more so in the future. Um, again, thank you to you all and especially to our panelists for, for joining us today. Thank you for organizing. Yeah.